Hey, hi all. Thank you for uh, for inviting me. Thank you for uh, being here. So today I will discuss a bit. I, I will give you an overview of this uh, new field of higher order network analysis, which is basically the study of uh, complex systems that display group interactions. So interactions uh, involving a number of unities higher than uh, the usual two that we consider in network science. And also in the final part, I will give you mm, a very small introduction to, to, to the work I've done in the context of motif analysis in hypergraphs, which is basically the description of this complex system with group interaction at their micro scale. Okay, so let's start by reviewing a bit the, the fact that, of course, we, we know that networks are very important and we use networks to model a uh, wide variety of, uh, of systems that involves unities that interact. And so we model unities with the nodes of uh, graphs, which is the mathematical framework we use. And of course, the interaction are the edges in graphs. And we did a lot with, uh, with networks because we wanted to understand a lot of systems from the, from the real world. And using graphs as a framework, we were able to uh, perform a lot of tasks on uh, networks with tools from graph theory. So we, for example, we were able to rank the nodes in a, in a network to understand what are the most important uh, nodes, for example, in a network. We were interested in clustering groups of nodes that display um, uh, a dense structure or they are related somehow. And we are also usually interested in understanding how things move over a network, so the dynamics of a network. But of course, nature is not this simple and we pretty soon realized that in the, in the sense that plane graphs can be sometimes a poor representation of systems because of course they are only able to model interactions, plane interaction between two nodes. But in the real world, sometimes we are interested maybe in modeling, for example, the direction of an interaction or the intensity of an interaction or the, of course, the temporality or the modality of an interaction. And if we use graph, usually we lost this, uh, we lose this information, right? For example, uh, in this case, if I try to model uh, the, the system of a dinosaur uh, interacting with, with a penguin in different modality with different temporality, and of course with different uh, direction of the messages with a simple graph, we are not able to do that. We lose the information. Instead, if we use a temporal graph or directed graph or a, a multi-layer graph, we, can able, we are able to encode the information we need. And depending on the complexity of the problem, or depending on the complexity that we want to encode in our model, we need to uh, select the, the, the right tool, of course. So if we are interested in direction, we use directed graph because we want to capture the complexity of the direction uh, in, the, in the system. And so in network science, it, it was natural to extend graphs and use this uh, framework, more complex framework. Um, uh, and we did a lot in, uh, in network science. We introduced directed graph, we introduced weighted graphs, temporal graphs, and multi-graphs multi to improve the understanding of the systems, uh, capturing more complexity. So uh, this, was a, this is a common trend in network science to get more expressive power, we add complexity to the system. And uh, of course, our algorithms and framework need to cope with the complexity we add. Uh, so every time we add uh, complexity, we want to encode more stuff in our model, we need to generalize traditional network notions, for example, centralities or communities notions to these uh, new frameworks. And sometimes, depending on the, on the model, we also have the possibility of defining new, new stuff, new notions, for example, studying temporal patterns or uh, edge overlap in multi-layer network, which are notion that doesn't have, uh, do not have uh, a meaning when we use traditional graphs. So now it's natural to go further this 
and we know that in nature it's common to uh, to see uh, group interaction for example co-authorship uh, uh, co uh, networks are, uh, are an example people write papers uh, together in group usually and so it, it's natural to ask if we need to cope with this complexity we um, we want to encode the this new explicit uh, we, if we want to explicitly encode this new information in our uh, model and uh, this is something that we want to answer somehow in this uh, in this presentation do we really need to handle group interaction in the same way that we needed to encode the temporality of the interaction or the uh, modality of the interactions and so I want to start with an example to understand why it's, it's, it's important to explicitly encode group interaction. So suppose you have three, three parties. So party one with uh, Sarah, Ross, uh, and Ellison participating. Party, party two with Sarah, Ross, Drew, and Elliot. And party three with uh, Ross, Elliot, uh, Keith, and Ellison. So if we only have graphs to model this, inform this, this situation, of course, we need to find a binary relation, and we can use when to a party together as a relation. So we have our nodes and we have our edges that encode this relation, and we get this graph, which is this our standard language as of now. But of course, this has some problems because we understand that we we, we easily see that we are losing information in this case because we don't know actually the number of parties only by looking at the graph. We don't know actually uh, the people that went to a party together, right? We know that, for example, uh, Sir and Ross went to a party together, but we don't know if they were alone at the, at the party or there were other people at the same party. So, uh, and also recovering uh, uh, explicitly the party structure is not, uh, is not easy because we can say, okay, if we find a click in the graph, it means that every node went to a party with the with every other node, so we can assume that it was a single party. But this is not the case because, for example, here we see a click of nodes, uh, but there is no party that involves Sarah, Ross, uh, Ellison, and Elliot together. So mm, we. Uh, so this, this representation is mis misleading and we have that the graph representation actually loses information from the, from the actual system. Instead, what we can do is to introduce a new framework, which is that of uh, hypergraphs. And uh, in an hypergraph, it's just a generalization of a graph in which links, in this case hyper edges, can link any number of nodes. So not just two, but we have sets of nodes that participate together in, a, in an interaction. So we can perform and so encode the, uh, the situation of the parties using hypergraphs. And we see that we are actually able to encode without losing information the, uh, the, the relation, the, the party relation. So the situation is that we got more expressive power using hypergraphs. And of course, we do not lose information with respect to, to graphs. Of course, uh, what these are higher uh, order uh, interactions, so we, we call group interaction or higher order interaction. And hypergraphs are not the only way to deal with these higher order networks. Um, for example, a common tool that was used uh, a lot is that of uh, bipartite graphs, which have uh, the uh, the advantage of being uh, graphs, so just plain graphs, simple graphs, but they have two kinds of nodes: one that represent the actual units of the system, and other types of nodes that represent the 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 group interaction. So you connect only nodes uh, with a binary relation, only nodes that are of different types but nodes of the same types cannot interact uh, directly. So unities don't directly interact, but may, they interact through another set of nodes that are the, uh, in this case, for example, the square nodes that represent the parties. So uh, using bipartite graphs, we are actually able to encode 
without losing information group interactions. For example, in here, the uh, party system was actually encoded correctly. But the problem is that uh, um, stating traditional problems from network science is easy, is easy on uh, using the language of hypergraphs than the language of bipartite graphs because hypergraphs are, uh, do not have this um, caveat of uh, having to introduce nodes with a different meaning. So you only have the traditional definition of a node and the interaction are naturally extended. So uh, hypergraphs just follow the, the, this, the uh, common thread in network science to add more complexity on the model, uh, extending the, 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 the interactions. And another common tool is Simplicial Complexes, which is a tool from algebraic topology. And uh, Simplicial Complexes are able to encode the group interaction. But the, the, the difference between uh, hypergraphs and Simplicial Complexes is that this tool, Simplicial Complexes, uh, by definition, uh, if you want to encode a group interaction of size three, for example, you also uh, need to encode in the model uh, all the possible interaction of size two. So you have this property of uh, the closure with respect to phases, which basically, if you have a, uh, an interaction, you also need to encode in the model all the possible sub-interaction. And uh, this could be problematic in, uh, in some systems, it depends on, on, on the applications. And but the advantage of this of this framework is that you have a lot of tools from algebraic topologies that can be useful. So just to sum up this part, so uh, higher order network analysis is a is a very young and really promising field. Uh, a lot is happening now. There is a lot of interesting problems from from applications, but of course. Since the, the, the area is pretty young, there is a, a lack of theoretical traditional tools uh, and software compared to, to standard graph uh, um, and network analysis. And of course, we have completely new problems. For example, if we have data that uh, is originated from a system that is a higher order by nature, but is uh, uh, stored only with, uh, in a pairwise fashion, so only binary relation. What if we want to recover the group interaction from this data? So there are lots of new interesting problems that are uh, completely and only related to using uh, higher order networks. And another really interesting aspect of this is that algorithm design tend to become really hard when dealing uh, with hypergraphs. So, as a computer scientist, I'm very interesting also uh, interested also in this uh, in this aspect of this research line. Okay, so we started from networks, so static dyadic links, and we mentioned that they are a fundamental tool to study real world systems of uh, interacting unities, and of course we know that. Networks have a long history and we have countless tools to, to study networks. But we also, we've also seen that nature is not as simple and sometimes we want to encode more information than just uh, a simple relation. We want to encode the direction of the relation, maybe a weight, maybe the temporal aspect of, a, of an interaction, maybe the modality of an interaction. And in this talk, we also, we also mentioned that Okay, nature is not only limited to pairwise interaction, we also have group interaction and maybe we, we want to exploit this in our modeling. We want to encode the, the information about groups in our modeling. So in, usually in my work, I use hypergraphs. So uh, this talk will most rely on hypergraphs as a tool. And we use hypergraphs to naturally encode group interaction without losing information but at the cost of having a more dif difficult uh, uh, algorithm design, or we need to design more uh, different and new statistical measures, for example. So in, in, in this line, one thing that uh, interested me was uh, to study uh, hypergraphs at their uh, 
local scale, which means that we want to understand the micro scale of a complex uh, system with group interaction. And this, this usually uh, relies on uh, network motifs, which is a very common and uh, common tool in network science. And the idea of network motifs is to describe networks in terms of the um, uh, number of time uh, certain patterns of subgraphs, really small subgraphs, because we are interested in local structure of graphs, uh, in the number of uh, of time a, um, a subgraph occur inside a, a large network. Uh, so what we usually do in network motif analysis is we define some patterns we want, or possibly all the possible patterns involve, involving a certain number of nodes, usually very small, and we count the occurrences of each pattern. And this is a very difficult problem from a computational point of view. And what we do generally is that we compare the occurrence of each pattern in the observed graph with respect to a null model, so a suitable randomization of, a, of our observed graph. And we mm, define a score to say if a pattern is overrepresented with respect to a, of a null model of, or uh, if it's underrepresented with respect to a null model. Uh, usually, we want also to build a significance profile of a network, which is basically just an ordered collection of the significance of each uh, pattern. And usually, we, we want it, this vector to be normalized. And the significance profile can be seen as a fingerprint of a, of a network at its micro scale. Okay, and this is very nice because there is a really fundamental and interesting result in network science. And is that if we compare the significance profile of networks from similar domains, uh, we see that this significance profile uh, tend to be correlated. So uh, networks from um, similar domains tend to have a, a correlated significance profile. And that's why, uh, network motifs are often told to be linked with the functionality of a, of a network. So, so uh, it's often believed that the functionality of a network can be explained in terms of uh, uh, the pattern and the local structure of a, of a network. And also, of course, networks from different domains tend to have uh, uncorrelated significance profile. And this is a really nice result. So uh, network motifs find an application in a number of domains from biology for the analysis of trans uh, transcriptomic networks, which is actually the domain uh, in which the original uh, authors of the study of ne the first network motifs were, uh, were interested. But they found application also in neuroscience, uh, sociology, and uh, finance. So because of this application, um, application or um, uh, the applications of network motifs, but also fundamental results uh, from a theoretical point of view in network science. Network motifs uh, have been extended uh, to uh, to other frames frameworks than just uh, directed graph, as in the first study. So we have temporal motifs, weighted motifs and multi-layer motifs. So we were actually interested in understanding how this notion of network motifs could be translated considering also group interaction and not just binary, binary relations. So if we consider um, three nodes, we, uh, usually the scale of network motifs is considering three, four, five, six nodes because we are, we are interested in the local structural network. So just small patterns. So uh, if we consider three nodes, for example, in hypergraphs, we have six possible patterns of interaction, which are these six uh, patterns here in uh, green. And we see that two patterns are made by just binary relation because hypergraphs generalize graphs. So uh, we have also those patterns, but we also have this 
patterns that involve at least one group. So we have a pattern with three nodes and only one uh, interaction of size three. We have an uh, interaction of size three and one binary relation, two binary relations and three binary relations. So in, in the real world, this means that if we have an uh, interaction of size uh, three uh, between three people, then um, we could also have uh, an interaction of size two that happened maybe later on in time. And we, when we aggregate in time the, the interaction, we find a, a, an hypergraph in which we have a group interaction and inside we have a lower order interaction in this case of size two. If we count the uh, number of uh, patterns, number of possible uh, non-isomorphic patterns with a certain number of nodes, we get that uh, in, in hypergraphs, this number grows uh, really, really fast. For example, with four nodes, we have 171 possible patterns. And here I reported some example just to, to see how, how different this pattern could be. We, we could have uh, interaction of size four, but also interaction of size uh, uh, three and uh, two. So, and they could also be nested. So you can have uh, interaction of size four and inside an interaction of size three, and possibly also a lot of interaction of size two. And of course, the, the number grows really fast. And with just more than the six nodes, it's not feasible to compute stuff, even the, the, the number, the exact number. So uh, this is interesting because uh, we mentioned that the, the first problem that we have when dealing with motives is uh, to compute the number of time a certain pattern um, appears in a, uh, in, in a network, of course, in a network. So one possible way to address the problem in, in hypergraph, just to mention, is that, OK, we, we don't care that we, uh, we, we come from, a, from an hypergraph, we just build a graph from uh, from the hypergraph. Uh, we call this step the projection of an hypergraph. So from a, a higher order system to a lower order representation, so a graph representation. But previously, we've seen that graphs are not able to encode group interaction. So we lose information. And for example, we have misleading result. We cannot apply uh, traditional motif algorithms to, to graph because we, we get uh, we, we get misleading results. For example, if we are looking for a pattern of subgraph, connected subgraph with three nodes in the projection, in this case, in this case, uh, the this yellow nodes from uh, form a triangle. If we get back to the to the hypergraph, we see that there is no interaction involving that three node. Uh, and so um, uh, the, the design of, uh, of the algorithm cannot be like projecting an hypergraph to a graph and uh, go back and uh, count the, the motif unless you explicitly um, and carefully encode this, uh, this scenario and uh, try to avoid the counting, okay? So uh, the, the problems remain. Uh, we, can't, we cannot rely on stuff that is already been done with, uh, with graphs. So we need to find uh, new algorithms and develop new methods. So we need to count the occurrences of each pattern involving a possibly group interaction, which is which still a very difficult problem, even more difficult than, uh, than uh, the, the traditional counting problem on, on graphs. We need, of course, again, to evaluate the significance of each pattern. In this case, as an old model, we use uh, the configuration model for uh, random hypergraph. And again, we define the overrepresentation and the representation of each pattern. And again, we build the significance profile of the, of the network we consider. OK, we will see the algorithm later. Let's just focus on the on the result. So uh, we wanted to analyze real world hypergraphs at their uh, local scale. Okay, so um, 
we collected a number of uh, of hypergraphs from different domain from uh, um, uh, email exchange data, co-authorship data, uh, also um, uh, people uh, interacting in group, for example, social pattern data, so people going uh, to a conference on high school interacting in schools or in hospital and so on. We also analyzed some biological data in, in, in the sense of uh, uh, gene disease interaction, so genes that contribute to a certain disease, or uh, uh, association of uh, drugs. And uh, what we found out is that, uh, of course, each, each network could be described in terms of the uh, overabundance or underabundance of uh, certain patterns, and we, we see that um, similar to similar to the case of networks, hypergraphs from a similar domain tend to share similar patterns, similar uh, significance profile, and networks from different domain tend to share uh, uh, uncorrelated profile. We are able to see that there are patterns that are more uh, uh, expressed in uh, in certain domain. For example, we see that the pattern C, the group interaction without any other nested uh, lower order interaction, is very underexpressed in uh, social and technological data. So uh, uh, people interacting and uh, email exchange, which means that basically if a group uh, interacted, it's very unlikely that the interaction will not involve, uh, we will, that uh, another lower order interaction didn't occur in the past or will not occur in the future. Uh, and so it's likely that people will meet again individually or, uh, or have met already individually be before meeting in group. And just another example, in the case of uh, a group interaction uh, pattern F with a group interaction with all the possible lower of the interaction, we see that in uh, technological data and social data is uh, very uh, expressed this pattern because um, it's very common that people tend to meet in group and then tend to meet again individually. Uh, instead, this is not actually the case for co-authorship data in which uh, people interact in group, but it's not guaranteed that they also interact in the past individually or will interact again uh, individually. So we see that the pattern D is uh, very expressed in co-authorship data and also biological data. This means that there is a fundamental different way in which group forms in, uh, for example, co-authorship data and biological data with respect to uh, social data. And maybe social data in um, social interaction, like face-to-face -face interaction, email exchange, it's easier to establish new interaction instead in co-authorship data, maybe you publish a paper in three people, but it's not guaranteed that all the possible uh, subset of the authors will uh, write a paper individually to, to get. And of course, by clustering this uh, significance profile, we get two big clusters. There are actually the social data and the co-authorship data and biological data. So, mm -hmm. They, uh, they are very different uh, classes of, uh, of uh, data in the same way that we, we found in the original study of network motifs. So we also studied a uh, pattern with uh, four nodes and not just uh, three. And uh, in this case, I want to focus on the important patterns of uh, each, uh, each class of data. So in social and technological data, we see again that we have patterns that involve a lot of interaction in, uh, in panel C. 
So we have lots of lower order interactions. Instead, in biological and co-authorship data, uh, we, we found that interaction of size four are popular, but we have very few interaction in, uh, in the patterns with respect to, to the other uh, domains. And they tend to be of larger size. So we have also, uh, we have this interaction of size four, we have nested interaction of size three. Instead, in, in the other domain, we have lots of interaction, but they tend to be all lower uh, cardinality. So we have lots of interaction of size two, for example. And uh, of course, if we analyze the uh, significance profile and we cluster uh, these profiles, we get again uh, the two different clusters. This time we have a more fine-grained clustering, but um, it's more interesting to analyze this uh, popular uh, uh, and most of our expressive patterns because we can go uh, and analyze this pattern at a larger scale. Uh, so, so in this case, mm, we are not very talking about motives because the analysis of motives tend to not scale uh, well in the number of uh, nodes involved in, in the pattern. So we cannot compute uh, exactly motive analysis. What we can do is we can analyze hyper edges of larger size than just three or four. So we can go higher, analyze hyper edges of size five, six, seven, and so on. And what we are interested in is analyzing the lower order structure inside this, um, this large hyper edges. So the nested structure we called in, in our paper, the nested organization. So uh, what we see is that also at the larger scale, we see what happened here in panel C. So in social and technological data, also at the larger scale, we see that we have a larger number of uh, interaction uh, of lower average size. So we have lots of interaction of smaller cardinality. And instead, in co-authorship and biological data, we have a a uh, smaller number of interaction that tend to be of larger average size. So uh, we, if we have an inter or, or a large group interaction in co-authorship data and biological data, we tend to find also other nested large uh, interaction. Instead in uh, social and uh, technological data, so email exchange, we find large interaction and a lot of uh, nested interaction that tend to be of size three or size two, basically. And this is this was very interesting because uh, we uh, we wanted to understand if this nested structure was related to the number of times a group interaction occurred occurred in the in the data. So we analyzed uh, social data, so face to face data. And we see that there is a correlation be, uh, between the weight of a group interaction and the number of uh, nested lower order interaction that we have inside the group interaction. So the higher the number of lower order interaction, the higher the weight of the group interaction. So uh, people meeting a lot individually tend to meet a lot also in, in group. And this was also the case studying some metadata related to, to our to, to some data that we have, so in this case high school, uh, high school data. We have also um, information about the friendship status of uh, students uh, collected uh, using a, a questionnaire, so directly asking students about their friendship status, but also data about uh, Facebook uh, friendship among students. So what we found out is that if we count the average number of uh, uh, friends relation uh, in, in a group, uh, this number is higher if we have, uh, um, if we consider group interaction with a lot of uh, nested uh, binary relations, so lower order relations. So in some sense, uh, a rich lower order structure makes group interaction stronger somehow. So 
in, in the sense of weights, so number of currents of group interaction, and in the sense of uh, stronger with respect to like some friendship score that we assign to, to a group. So just to recap, uh, we cannot directly apply traditional network motives method to understand group interaction and hypergraphs. And so we needed to develop completely new methods. And we introduced methods to perform higher order motif analysis and we extracted uh, some fingerprints of hypergraphs at a micro scale. And we see, we've seen the emergence of families of hypergraphs with similar local structure, meaning uh, the, uh, the family of face-to-face -face interaction and email exchange data and the family of co-authorship data and biological data, drug association and gene disease association. We've seen that uh, hypergraphs from different domain tend to show not only a very different structure in terms of motifs, but also in terms of the nested structure of hyperedges. And we also seen that in the social data, a richer nested structure of pairwise links inside group interaction makes uh, uh, such group interaction strong. So as of now, we are actually interested in the temporality of the hyperedges in these uh, small patterns, and we are actually working on them on, on it. And, we, we hope to have some results soon. And so uh, I, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on more a, an application-oriented discussion about motives. Like if I really want to perform this, uh, this analysis on actual data, uh, we introduced some baseline algorithm to perform such uh, such analysis and analyzing large uh, large data sets such as co-authorship data it took like uh, nine hours uh, which in, in motives is not uh, it's it's a lot because you also need to perform the analysis on usually on randomization of a of your uh, of your data, so you need to perform a lot the counting, and uh, you need to apply a lot the algorithm. So nine hours is just to count um, the occurrences in in just one data set, discarding uh, the time of uh, of the randomization. And this baseline uh, was based actually on the projection of the hypergraph. So from an hypergraph, we went to a graph. And we counted the motifs, uh, lower order motifs on uh, on the graph. Then we went back to the hypergraph, and we actually needed to perform a different uh, different steps depending on the uh, on, on if the pattern was actually a true uh, group interaction pattern or it was just like um, information lost because of what we mentioned before. And this this actual this uh, additional process took a lot of time. That's why I, I said that it's not actually feasible to perform uh, motif analysis on hypergraphs using uh, all the methods. And actually, we were not able to analyze a lot of data because of this uh, limitation. So we introduced an algorithm that is able to directly exploit hypergraphs, the hypergraph structure. And so considering the same data set from nine hours, we got to nine mediums. And I don't want to go actually in the details of this algorithm, but it's really nice that not only from a modeling point of view, you need to care about uh, directly encoding group interaction, but also from a computational point of view, it's worth working directly using group interaction because you, you get a lot of improvement. And also, in a recent um, paper, we uh, introduced uh, a way to com perform motif analysis uh, uh, using a sampling method, so sampling algorithm. Um, so basically, you trade some accuracy in the result for a gain in performance. And so from nine minutes, we go to 27 in to analyze geology co-authorship data, which is actually a good uh, uh, good result because 
geology is, is a big deficit. And also the, the results are good because we have the optimal results we could compare to the same, the same the results obtained from a sampling method. And in the paper, we have some comparison and they are actually good approximations. So uh, going further on the application side, yeah, uh, hypergraphs are very nice, but what if I want to actually use uh, hypergraphs in my using my my data. So we were interesting a lot in uh, making uh, these tools accessible to people. So we developed a library, a Python library that is open source and already available uh, on GitHub. And this library, uh, the focus is uh, on the analysis of a real world uh, system with group interaction. So uh, we mainly care about hypergraphs in this case but we are expanding to maybe other tools. And you have a wide variety of tools and algorithms to construct, uh, use hypergraphs, encode information hypergraphs, visualize hypergraphs, and of course, analyze hypergraphs. We have some methods from a lot of papers from literature. And we hope the library to be, that, that is user-friendly, accessible, uh, and we expect to be applied on a variety of different application and use cases. So uh, you can store and manipulate hypergraph, just to mention a few things. You can convert higher order data from different representation to different representation. You can extract basic statistics about the nodes and hyper edges. Oh, for example, the centrality of the nodes. We can perform motif analysis, community detection, you can apply filters to reduce the size of the hypergraphs, and you can run simulation of dynamical processing. And then, of course, you can visualize hypergraph even if it's a, not a trivial task. So it, it can become pretty soon a mess to visualize hypergraph. So these are just um, some example of use cases. You, you, this, this is just a figure from, uh, from our paper. Uh, different analysis on the same data set, which is uh, uh, high school data encoded as a hypergraph, so keeping the group interaction in the high school data. And we applied uh, some basic statistics, uh, like, such as the degree distribution of the nodes, motif uh, analysis, communities. Uh, we applied filters um, and, and so on. We, we also tried to visualize uh, some interaction in, in in the data. So ju just to uh, give an overview, uh, we want to make the library user friendly. So we are trying to go in that direction. For example, uh, just to mention, if you want to compute motif analysis of an hypergraph, it should be really easy to load your hypergraph. And we are also planning to make a lot of data available directly as a hypergraph. And you should be able to compute motifs just with one line of code and also to plot your result using only one line and obtaining some something like this. We have we are actually mm, making a lot of tutorials, so you should be able to find a lot of tutorials to use possibly all the different tools in the, in the library, so from basic stuff to centrality communities and so on, and motifs. And we have uh, recently published a paper presenting this library. The library is available on, uh, on GitHub. And uh, uh, we, we developed this as a, as a, as a, as a large team, uh, team effort we have. Uh, lots of people from uh, around Europe. And of course, we are in the early stage of, um, of the development, of development, so we welcome feedback, discussion, and uh, contributions. And we are particularly interested in uh, ideas for uh, new domains and uh, collecting new data to be, to be analyzed as a, directly as a higher order data, so hypergraph hypergraph data. Uh, yeah, let's see.
thank you for uh, the attention and I'm very open for questions and uh, feedback for this work. Thank you.